Um, but this is such, and it's such an exciting topic to be talking about, and with such a such a really wide, uh, such an esteemed panel of uh, really brilliant folks. Um, let me just uh, quickly introduce all of them. Um, first over here we have uh, Jacques Sabisaho, who is the founding and executive founder and executive editor of Amani Global Works, which works to improve health in his, on his native Ijwi Island in Africa's Democratic Republic of Congo. Um, he, it, it has a preventive and emergency health care through the creation of sustainable medical facilities. Um, previously, he was president and medical supervisor of the community of Sant Egidio Egidio in DRC, and he managed and conducted the Pueri Cantores of Bukavu, which was a professional children's choir. Um, he's received the Richard Holbrook Leadership Award, Rising Star Award, Visionary Making an Impact on Global Health Award, and Pharmacy Team Excellence Award. Um, and he's here as an Aspen New Voices Fellow. Um, for those of you who heard him yesterday speak on the, um, at the Aspen New Voices uh, at the reception, you know what a passionate and, a, and really incredible individual he is. Um, next to him, we have Peter Drobak, who is the executive editor of Partners in Health in Rwanda. Um, he's also an associate physician at Brigham and Women's Hospital, and he teaches global health and social medicine at Harvard Medical School. Um, at PIH, or Partners in Health, he works with the Rwandan government to provide high-quality health care and social services in three rural districts and to drive health innovation systems to, uh, innovations to scale. Um, he also co-leads a large health systems research program in Rwanda, the Population Health Implementation and Training Partnership. Um, he was appointed in 2011 to be chairperson of the Board of Rwanda Biomedical Center, which is an implementation agency of Rwanda's national health sector. So thank you so much for being here with us, Peter. Um, next to him we have Raj, who is the CEO of the Last Mile Health and of Last Mile Health, and he's also associate physician in the Division of Global Health Equity at Brigham and, uh, Brigham and Women's Hospital at Harvard Medical School. Um, he returned to his native Liberia to co-found Last Mile Health, which works with the Liberian government to give villagers in remote areas the training, equipment, and support they need to become professional frontline health workers. Um, he's been named a social disruptor by the Forbes 400 Summit in Philanthropy. Um, he's a, the fellow of the Draper, Draper Richard Kaplan Foundation, Mulago Foundation, and Echoing Green, and the Global Health Track Advisor for the Clinton Global Initiative. Um, and finally, we have Sean Duran, who is the Tribal Programs Administrator for the Taos Pueblo Tribal Community in New Mexico. She described her role to me as almost being a mayor. She oversees, um, oversees health, education, water and sanitation, and everything, um, and the like. She's uh, dedicated to the pursuit of, ec of educational, economic, and social equality for residents of the Pueblo, and is equally committed to self-governance. Um, she also, prior to this, she managed the Taos Public Ed Education and Training Division, which oversees uh, Head Start and the Red Willow Education Center over there. Um, so these are our very esteemed panels. I'm really excited to have, um, hopefully, a very fresh, forward-looking discussion about, about the challenges and the opportunities within Last Mile Healthcare. Um, all of these people have worked on the ground, have worked in, you know, really on the unglamorous side of what last mile healthcare delivery really looks like. And um, so I hope to explore the challenges that they, that they encounter in their work and also the opportunities they see in the, over the next 10 years. Um, so I'd like to just start by asking all of you a question, um, just to throw it out there and open it up, which is, um, what do you see as the, as the biggest challenge in last mile healthcare today? So, Jacques, do you want to take that? Yes. I, I think our biggest challenge, you know, coming from an island, completely marginalized island, and away from, I would, I would say, the rest of the civilization, you know, where you have, you know, one healthcare system uh, facility far away from the communities, and it's mountainous, you know, you know, people just have a hard time to reach the facility. They, they just don't go there, and we, you know, we realized that most people were dying, most uh, children and women were dying, not, uh, not that uh, they didn't want to go to, the, uh, to seek health care, but they couldn't reach it. You do, just don't want to walk eight hours hiking uh, to just seek care, you know, they just got discouraged. That was the most challenging part. Mm -hmm. It's still challenging, we, we managed to, to build a facility in the small clinic, but people have to still work hard, uh, yeah. a long ways, yeah. Absolutely. 
Yeah, I think distance is a huge, and especially your, uh, you mentioned that you're on your island. You only recently got wireless connectivity and um, right. only a couple of years got the, got the telephone. So I'm sure that if someone has a healthcare emergency, yeah. um, what, do they, what do they typically do? You know, when uh, we, we still, you know, it's still uh, being developed. Um, we've been managed to, to expand the wireless connection to one kilometer radius, which is great for a place that has never been connected before. Not even a place in, in DRC alone, connection, those who have been there, connection, cell phone connection, uh, internet connection is almost non-existent. So we, we hope, uh, we, we, we're trying to, you know, to do what, uh, like Mohamed Yunus did, you bring the bank to the people. We want to bring mm. you know, the healthcare. My colleagues, uh, Peter and, and Sean and Raj will talk more about that. Uh, we, by training more community health workers, and building maybe small uh, facilities, but investing heavily, heavily investing in community health workers, that will be the solution for us. Yeah. So Peter, I know that you work in Rwanda, which is widely seen within Africa to be a uh, you know, bringer of a lot of innovative healthcare um, within the, in the last mile system. Um, what are the biggest challenges that you still see today? Well, Rwanda's made tremendous progress, and I would say that, you know, because there's no simple solution to, to solving problems for last mile communities, to me, the major challenge is to make last mile health a, a first mile priority for those who design and fund health systems, and of course, those who implement them. And I think Rwanda, where I've lived and worked for about a decade, has provided a really powerful example of the, the wisdom of that approach. There's another term for that, and it's health equity. And, uh, you know, this month, or, the, or the, over these three months, we're, we're observing the 20th anniversary of the 1994 genocide that took uh, over a million lives in a hundred days and displaced uh, several million more into Congo and elsewhere and, and, and sort of uh, catalyzed this, this uh, regional destabilization which still really affects uh, all of us today. Uh, and 10 years after that, in 2004, when we were first invited by the government of Rwanda uh, to, to come and help to rebuild the health system, there had been halting progress but still tremendously long ways to go. And, uh, and we were, uh, Partners in Health, were, were sent by the government into some of the most remote communities, in fact the worst off communities in Rwanda. Rwanda in terms of uh, development, health indicators, infrastructure, etc. So what we found was similar to what Jock sees and Raj sees and anyone who does this work uh, sees every day. No roads, no electricity, very little communications infrastructure, health facilities that are either derelict or non-existent, uh, a lack of providers, and a lack of access. So even what exists there is poor quality and people uh, even in those communities can't access them because of financial barriers, geographic barriers, etc. And when asked um, the government when asked why they sent us to these sort of most remote worst off places what they said was well if we can find a way to succeed here in uh, in the worst off most marginalized parts of the country we can do it anywhere and so let's use that as our roadmap and so what we did was set to work um, together with the public sector to build clinics in underserved areas to train and deploy community health workers to try to uh, resolve financial barriers by providing universal health care access and other things that we can talk about, uh, but also to make those last mile districts innovation hubs where we could take lessons from there and use that to strengthen the healthcare system in the rest of the country. And uh, it's only been one piece of the equation, uh, but, I, but I think the, the wisdom of the approach has really been borne out. And over the last decade, Rwanda's seen the most dramatic advances or improvements in population health uh, and, and really prosperity anywhere in the world in the last 50 years. Uh, life expectancies doubled since the genocide. Uh, it, mortality from AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria has dropped by about 80 percent. million people have pulled themselves out of poverty. Um, and, and all this is happening while equity is actually improving. And so um, I think based on our experience, uh, you know, I could say that um, prioritizing last mile communities is not only morally the, the right thing to do, but also epidemiologically very smart. Right. Um, so Raj, what about you and, and, and your work in Liberia? What have you seen um, as being, you know, really large challenges that you'd like to address over the next 10 years. Yeah, and we're, you know, at Last Mile Health, we're in Liberia working to, you know, in essence, create a new workforce to save lives in, in these Last Mile villages or the world's most remote villages. And we, as you said, give local villagers the equipment, training, the tools that they need to perform at a higher level than you expect a typical village health worker to perform really as a professional when in villages that are two days away. And I, certainly all the, the, the challenges you'd expect, the, the operational ones, how do you, in a place without cell coverage, get referrals in when a village worker runs into a woman with labor and they need to get to a clinic? How do you um, 
train continuously uh, at the village level and p manage and support the performance of these village health workers is another another challenge. But I, I'd say that the chief barrier, though, still is is really an idea. It's it's cynicism. I mean, I think that mm. that there is still a disbelief that places this remote. Uh, without the cell coverage, without the roads, without the banks, without the water, without the doctors, without the clinics, uh, can change their trajectory. That that actually positive health can come. I give you a quick example. We s were asked by the government of Liberia to go in a place called Konabo two years ago. That uh, is a place 17 hours from the capital. It is. Uh, an area that's about the size of 50 Manhattans, 42 villages. Uh, only one of those villages has ever had access to care, ever. Um, and we were told at that time that uh, by a lot of institutions, um, uh, well-meaning ones, that uh, this is a place that if you go and try to set up, no NGO had ever, nonprofit had ever worked in that region, set up a, an office in that area. If you go there and you get stuck in the roads, we're not going to pull you out. Um, if, uh, if, you, if you go there and you're, uh, you're failures. I mean, they, you know, they, they even called us uh, a Bush NGO, which is, a, you know, uh, that we're, we're Bush people. We're going out to work with the Bush. So these are the types of things that happen. We have since, through people like Alice, who's in the audience here today, an outreach nurse from Liberia, is an Aspen scholar here, uh, been able to deploy for every one of these villages a professionalized community health worker have covered for the first time in Liberia's history, a place this remote, every human being has health care right at their doorstep, from malaria care and immunization to prenatal care. And I just got my blood pressure checked there a couple of weeks ago, uh, so we're doing hypertension care. Uh, it's care that's really unprecedented. And we've seen what was the worst performing district in the country, 11 12% immunization rates, 15 20% prenatal care rates. Those numbers are now 90 95 97% go from the worst performing to the best performing remote district, and the government's now asking us to take this to 300 more villages and help them write a national plan uh, to do this in other places. So there's cynicism as a barrier. You can get across that challenge, and then more cynicism comes, and now the cynicism <laughs> is, well, can you really scale it? Yeah. And where's the financing gonna come from for, say, paying these community health workers, and there's a cynicism there. So I still think that is the biggest barrier um, that, that prevails. I think it's amazing that there is so much cynicism, though, um, given that there are so many, obviously, I'm just on this panel, so many excellent examples of places where you actually put the effort in to deliver care at the last mile, and you actually see real health improvements. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to see, you know, at what point that will enter the, uh, you know, the conversations that high-level individuals at governments yeah. and financing institutions will start having. Yeah. Um, Sean, I'm so glad that there's someone here who's from the U.S. who's, uh, who's speaking about last mile health care in this country. Um, so from your perspective, what have you seen as the biggest challenges to delivering health care to Taos Pueblo? Well, first of all, I want to uh, recognize what the panelists have mentioned about no running water, the roads. You know, and I'm sitting here thinking that sounds a lot like home. Um, <laughs> and I'm in the United States. Yeah. Uh, and we deal with um, doing more with less. I believe that building the capacity from within the community is very important. But one of the underlying aspects I believe is very critical is that of culture and language. Um, if you have someone from within your own community that understands the traditions, understands the culture, and really um, knows about indigenous knowledge as well in the medical realm, and couple those with clinical aspects, I think then you have a very powerful foundation. Um, I, I tend to look more at the, the opportunities as opposed to the challenges, um, but I see within those challenges those opportunities right. of, of really recognizing that and bringing that um, and really looking at health holistically as opposed to it's just a clinical model or it's just this or that. Like, for example, um, in our community we have... Um, a certain way of, of burying the deceased. And that may not be what it happens when someone dies in a hospital. We have a different way of doing that. And so what we've had to do is train our community health workers that are from our community, that understand our culture and our traditions, how to do that um, in a way that's sanitary, in a way that it's not gonna you know, be infectious or anything like that. 
um, when that happens. That's just one example. Another one is, is you know, definitely supporting the community health workers, but really sometimes um, how are they connected to like doctors and, and folks that do have the medical degrees and how can we use technology to support those folks? Even if they are remote, if there's, if there's internet connection or whatever you have, there's ways to do that. So I tend to look at it more at the opportunity level than the challenges, but I mean, challenges do bring up yeah. ways of working and moving forward. Mm. So how have you dealt specifically, I know that you're really passionate about mm -hmm. um, you know, making sure indigenous knowledge mm -hmm. stays within, our, within the health system. Um, so how exactly have you been able to implement that throughout, your, throughout Taos Pueblo? We're on a journey, we're on a pathway. And uh, for example, um, there is a great um, federal law that helps tribes to take on programs and services called self-governance. Um, and they um, are able to take on those inherent federal functions, still coupling with the federal government, as you know, but tribes have had a unique opportunity in working with the federal government for the last 200 years, which some of the folks with third world countries may not have had that opportunity. So we've got a track record, so to speak. And I think from that perspective, for example, if we took over our clinic, which we're lo looking to do within the next two years, mm. how would that model look? It would be a blended model. It would have um, your community representatives, indigenous knowledge, for example, like your midwives, folks that have um, herbal remedy knowledge, things like that, that are still true, but also working with the medical side of it to say, yes, that will work, or yes, that may not work. Um, but being able to accept old with the new. I think that's a that's really a future for for as a model that we could look at collectively. Yeah, Shock. I know that you've spoken also about um, bringing indigenous knowledge into into last mile healthcare. Um, have you been able to do that? I just I, one thing that I've seen in um, in my reporting whenever I've traveled is that um, you know people say that, but then when there is someone with indigenous knowledge, they're often just dismissed, or you know mm -hmm. you just listen to them for a minute, and it's like, oh yeah, okay, there's this traditional healer there. Um, have you been able to find a way around that to get make sure that everyone feels respected? Yes, but you know, you, you know, for those who who know my story, uh, that's how our story starts. Indigenous people made the healthcare system, healthcare system happen to Iju Island. Mm -hmm. And they are the ones who saved it when we were threatened by the powerful landowners. Mm -hmm. They saved it. And people acknowledge that. It's still hard you know, to, you know, to get them accepted within the community. But uh, we, we're working hard. You know, it's very hard. It's a very long process. It's, you know, it's, it's culture, culture. I myself have been you know, uh, cast out from some of, uh, of my family. Uh, my uncles are the kings of this island, so you're not supposed to touch pygmies. So I do that. And I, I, I just ma made it clear I don't care as long as they, f they feel great. I believe that whatever we do, whatever we invest in, you know, it doesn't matter how, ma how many millions you invest in this, wherever they, they live. Everybody can get rich. We can, uh, the malaria uh, the rate can drop down everything. But as long as these indigenous people are not taken care of, they will always pull us down. Mm. I made it clear to the community. I told them, it's through them that we got this. It's through them that we'll all, you know, we'll all go up with them, but not without them. So we, you know, the king is slowly acknowledging that. Some indigenous people are now coming from the mainland, which is amazing. And some we now register. We sing our, you know, every day, every week we have five or six indigenous people coming from Rwanda, crossing and just coming to our small clinic. So I believe this is a great sign. And uh, maybe some other people look at this and, and uh, you know, uh, just to summarize, when you have life expectancy of under 25. When your children cannot live longer, and when a woman, and I, I, I see this young woman who just asked me a simple question, why, why are human beings, children, living longer than our, ours? So I asked her, what do you mean? Aren't you a human being? She said, no, I'm not a human. I'm a pygmy. So they are raised believing that they are they lo that they don't exist. They are raised. I have been marginalized. I feel the pain. And, but I'm lucky, you know, it didn't matter. I was marginalized, but I got out. I, I got education. I live in the United States. I can travel. I can do whatever I want. But they are condemned. It's over for them. But I believe that if we don't invest in indigenous people, wherever it's in Ijwi, 
in, uh, in Congo, in Tanzania, in Uganda, in the United States, I don't think will make it. Mm. Mm. Yeah. One thing that we were all talking about before, um, we all met a little bit before the panel, um, was the idea of developing trust, which I think goes along with, you know, mm -hmm. making sure indigenous communities feel like they have, you know, that, that their knowledge is actually being passed on. Um, I don't know, Peter or Raj, if you could um, talk to this about um, how you've seen that idea of, you know, bringing trust in with last mile healthcare delivery. I can start. Yeah. Um, you know, we one of the areas that we work is in Northwest Rwanda. It's actually fairly close to um, uh, to DRC, uh, where Jacques is based, and actually to this island. And some of the communities are actually the same, and there are pygmy communities there as well. And um, I think all everybody on this panel has taken sort of a radical step in our work of actually embedding ourselves within the communities that we're working with, either because we're from there or because we just chose to do so because it was the most effective way to do so. And that just recognizes the fact that there are sort of context independent factors that are going to help work everywhere, but that solutions are always going to have to come from, uh, uh, from a locally driven process as well, and it has to be participatory, and it requires local knowledge. It's not always about culture, because as Jacques was saying, the, the pygmy communities that he's been working with say, I'm not human, I'm pygmy. That's not a cultural thing, that's a consequence of exclusion, right? That's a social and political thing uh, instead. And, and we face the same thing first coming into these, these uh, communities in, in, in northwestern Rwanda. Um, it's, a, it's a part of the country that was the center of sort of the, 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 uh, the genocidaire ideology um, going back to pre-genocide. And so there was a segment of the Rwandan population that was still 15 years later afraid to even go there um, because their lives may be at risk and their families were afraid for them to go there. Uh, and then you have these communities for even when we built a beautiful health center just nearby, didn't come. And it's not because they didn't want to come or they didn't believe in modern medical care, it's because they didn't feel like they belonged there. Um, or they had a right to be there. And so, uh, so, so what we did was spend a lot of time with outreach uh, with community health workers, with a local nun who had been working with the community for a long time, making outreach visits into the community and delivering the care directly to those communities. Um, and then we hired a bunch of people to come and work at the nearby facility and be part of the system and be able to come back and say, actually, this place is okay. This is a place where we belong. They bring their family, then other families start to come as well. And so it's really, it really was just a matter of sort of building relationships over time uh, but it means you got to put in the time and you got to be there and put in the, the sort of sweat equity to do so. And whether that's us or community health workers, it's an important part of the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. you, you want me to say something? Yeah, yeah. Well? Uh, you know, and, and uh, some similar challenges, right? DRC, Rwanda, Liberia, in the sense that has been wars actively, a lot of distrust that's been broken between <coughs> various members of the groups. My, my family, we, I grew up in Liberia. And Alice and a number of others, thousands were displaced during the war. Almost a good 70% of the country was displaced. And so there was a big effort in the last 10 years. We ended the conflict in 2003 um, to actually rebuild Liberia and make it another example of, of a, a model for post-conflict recovery. And so what we've seen is, look, when you invest in the last mile, these are places that are the most remote, most marginalized. We had our war started in that place. I mean, the guy who started our war took 300 people in these villages and brought them on to fight with them to start Charles Taylor. And he, certainly the rhetoric involved, you don't have health care, you don't have education, you don't have a job, your parents didn't have it, your grandparents didn't have it. So what opportunity is there? So I think what's fascinating, uh, three years later, uh, uh, three years ago in Ivory Coast, we work right on the border with Ivory Coast, a lot of the same ethnic group that we work with are on that side. They just had a war. They were militia leaders on that side that were reported in The Economist to recruit Liberian young men to fight in that war, which they didn't have anything to do with directly, mm -hmm. for about $300 to fight someone else's war. We pay our workers $80 a month, $720 uh, a year, um, or $960 a year. And uh, we have 60% uh, of our workforce is young men who used to fight in places like that. So I think what we see in investing in the last mile, which, you know, besides being is the greatest opportunity for global health in the next 15 years, is that the kind of coverage you'll get. It also turns out to be at least in post-conflict settings, I imagine in rural remote settings deprived of other kinds of violence, structural violence, uh, or it also tends to have intangible benefits, such as rebuilding trust within communities, providing jobs, having people care for one another, actually seeing someone 
heal alone has an impact on people when people were just dying at ages of what you said 25 years and our area average age of death was 29 years that when that changes that that also builds trust itself but the thing that you mentioned that's really interesting is that you, how you're paying the, these frontline health workers actually to, to be part of the community, um, to, to go out and actually do, do this type of work. Um, I know that's been a really uh, tricky question within the global health world about you know, these frontline health workers who are going out. Should we be providing them uh, financial incentives to do so? Should they be volunteers? Should we give them non-monetary incentives like bicycles and clothing and things like that? Um, how, how did you end up deciding to give them money? They do good work. <laughs> I mean, it's as simple as that. They, they save lives, and why wouldn't you want to invest in that? Um, you know, we, our, our simple effort is to treat people, uh, you look at it from all sorts of ways. You want to take the moral angle, it makes sense. People who do good labor, who don't have a job, 85% unemployment, and are, uh, uh, deserve to get paid. Pure simple, doesn't matter what they do, they deserve that. Take the economic analysis. Um, you have a, a country, at least Liberia, there's a billion people in the world who live in places like this. 50% of the 75 top countdown countries for the MDGs have only median, uh, the median coverage is just 50% for the basic health, family planning, prenatal care, immunizations. You've got a, the largest informal, the largest workforce on the planet are these indigenous people. Why not invest $80 per person um, and actually provide health care where you can't do it now. You can't cover half of the people, and you could provide it. It's greater bang for the buck. So I think those are just, you know, they're so, it's just obvious. I think the, the challenge is, is how do you do this at scale, and I think the opportunity that the groups like the Global Fund, USAID, uh, the World Bank have, uh, as well as in-country governments allocating their own central budget, is to, is to take this opportunity. I mean, to invest in health care, you create jobs, it's education. A lot of these people go on to become the nurses and doctors of the future mm -hmm. and, uh, and provide care where you haven't been able to do it before. So I, I think it's just a matter of, of getting more uh, clarity about how the planning goes. And I mean, places like Rwanda, you guys have already achieved that. 45,000, did you say, 45, workers? Strong, yeah. Community health workers who are all financed. Mm -hmm. So this can be done. It's not impossible. It just needs to happen more mm. and faster. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I want to go back to that indigenous people, the trust. Uh, I, I believe, I, I believe we, we, we speaking like we just go to the community and tell them, you know, just accept these people, they are part of us. No, I don't think we did that in the first years we started. It didn't work out. They just tell you, no, we don't need these people. They clearly tell you we don't need them. So you have to be uh, clear and firm and, and use a model like, uh, you know, you tell them, okay, you want this health care, you want to be hospitalized, you need health care, it's, it's free, but you have to accept and accept that a pygmy can also be hospitalized. The first time we hospitalized a pygmy, everybody went away. For one month, we didn't have a patient. Oh my gosh. For one month. It was hard, you know, you know I felt, you know, I have to be honest, I felt like everything I've been doing for many years, you know, just stopped that day. But the pygmy came, we had a few pygmy patients coming, we sent out the community health workers telling them they are as human as you are. So, so those who suffered and really needed help, help and needed to be hospitalized, some will come and say, I will, I'll be hospitalized, but I don't just don't want to share a room with a pygmy. You just made it clear, we'll provide you the best care you can, but you have to share. There is no other way around that. So you don't bargain that. And you, we, we create something, we have a, a girls and, and adolescent groups. All the girls will come, but we, we bought uh, soccer uh, balls, we give them something, it's great. But we told them, we'll not continue, we start, we know what we're doing, we'll not continue this if we don't have 10 pygmy girls here. So this is something they enjoy. We, we consciously start something we know they love, because we know we want to integrate pygmies. Uh, so cause that's the only way for us. That's mm -hmm. the only way we can do things. And slowly, things are working. Are working. We studied so a soccer. This is a small thing. Soccer team, all the men, everybody loves soccer. We knew they love it. We bought jerseys. We know. Yeah. <laughs> right now, yeah. Jerseys and everything. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. 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 So like three months later, we knew they were into it. We said, what about the pygmies? 
don't they like playing soccer? They say, oh, no, 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 they are not like us. I said, okay, I'm going to start a soccer team with the pygmies. <laughs> we move everything to the pygmies. So then they realize, okay, we'll accept just one. And we bargain like that, and then the second, the third, and, and things. So, uh, you know, but the, uh, another, th yeah, that's what I want to emphasize on. on. We need to be uh, aggressive, and firm, and have strategies how to integrate this. Because otherwise, it won't it won't work out. It's amazing because you went in, you know, with this idea of providing healthcare, and eventually it it's bloomed into something much more than that. Just you know, understanding this um, broader idea that uh, Peter was sort of um, dancing around that you know, health is just a human right, and just you know, helping people understand their self worth. Um, which is fantastic. Um, so I wanted to ask one other question, which I realize that none of you have brought up at all, which is about um, technology and how technology is going to help change uh, last mile healthcare delivery. Um, what, have, what have you all seen so far? Peter, maybe we could. Uh. Sure. So, you know, I'd say that while uh, technology is not a panacea, and sometimes in places like this, it's all people want to talk about, it's been a really, really important tool, and I think there's still yet tremendous untapped opportunity. Um, you know, in, in Rwanda, as, as Raj mentioned, um, uh, we, the public sector, has deployed, trained and deployed an army of 45,000 community health workers, three in every community in the country, um, who are elected by their communities, and they're trained and professionalized, and they're compensated. It's a complicated financing model. It's kind of social entrepreneurial and we won't go into it necessarily right now. Um, uh, but that's a vast number of, you know, additions to the workforce, 45,000. They're doing all kinds of stuff. They're, pro you know, um, they're providing family planning services, treating malaria, engaging pregnant women and bringing them to the health center. Um, they're accompanying patients with chronic diseases like HIV and cancer. And the list goes on, helping with vaccinations, et cetera. There's a massive amount of data. So one of the things that we found when, this, when this, the, these community health workers were deployed was they had this really complex reporting system. They get performance-based financing, meaning they get paid on the results they deliver, the number of women they bring in, et cetera, but they have pages and pages and pages of stuff they got to fill out and submit every month, and then someone's got to compile that all into one report for that health center, and that's got to be compiled to the district, et cetera. When we looked at it, we found that the quality of the data were actually terrible, um, and, uh, and you can't actually use bad data to make decisions. It's better to have no data. Uh, and so, uh, so one place that technology can really, um, uh, can really have a huge impact there is to simplify uh, some of the record keeping and reporting and performance measurement that's done um, through through basic mobile technologies. Uh, we use a rapid SMS system where now every birth and death in the community, at least death uh, among a child under five and a maternal death, is reported by a community health worker with an SMS. And so it goes into a central data bank. And we've just started this process now where that notification comes to the local hospital and then they send a team out um, after some time to visit the community and the family if it was a death outside of the facility and find out what happened and try to turn every bad event like that into a learning opportunity. So it allows us to get a lot more granularity into what's happening, not waiting every five years for the big survey, but instead understanding what's happening in real time and identifying hot spots um, where things aren't going well and trying to make interventions there. Uh, and that's just, the, I think, scratching the surface. I'd like to mention a little bit about technology. Um, we talked about the community health workers, and um, for us, um, they could have information on the iPad that go that when they go visit an elder in a home, and um, that information is automatically given over to the physicians at IHS, the Indian Health Service, so they're actually seeing the same information um, that becomes part of their patient file. Also, um, you know, to explain diabetes or heart um, disease or anything like that, utilizing um, 3D models on an iPad to explain to them in their own language about what their, their uh, issue is, helps them, the trust again, helps them understand it and like, oh, that's what it is. Mm -hmm. So that, that's how we're using it in our community. Um, and one of the next things we're looking at is panic buttons and, and alert systems for um, elders so that when they press a button, uh, GPS shows exactly where they're at and then it sends an emergency response call to 911 if they need it. Um, it that can also be utilized for um, folks that have like um, amnesia or Alzheimer's or anything like that um, for emergency situations for, for folks. So that's one way technology um, is use, utilized and can be utilized in the future is to help explain um, an individual or a patient's health care need. 
um, so that they're understanding even about medications and the side effects and things like that. That's great. I'm going to make it's like a joke, but it's a reality about technology. I think how it helped us. This is a community that believes so much in witchcraft. And in order to succeed, you know, if you fail, it's witchcraft. If you succeed, maybe, you know, it's, and it was hard. And some people would show up and come to me and say, no, you'll never succeed because this group of people will not let you do this because they don't like this and that. When we, we, we had our internet, something we did, uh, we showed, uh, this, this recent, we, showed, we just invited a group of, of men from different various communities, including uh, pygmies. So someone was uh, at 500 meters with a computer. We, we just did a Skype. So you, you'll see the other people 500 meters <laughs> far away from the clinic, and the other, this other group at the clinic. And they could see each other and talk to each other. So one wo elder woman said, you must be a witchcraft. <laughs> <laughs> I, I said, yes, I am. Because <laughs> I've been able to do this. So if, you know, so don't play with me. You need to believe in this. <laughs> And <laughs> so, in that way, technology is helping us, you know. Like people, Valid people believe, indigenous. Yeah, I am okay. witchcraft so because right. I bought it. Yeah. This is huge, you know. You can speak, they, you know, it's... You know, it's I don't know whether that's genius or evil. I can't decide. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's terrific. Um, so I was wondering if we could uh, jump now to questions from the audience. I'm sure all of you have a lot of things to, um, to add to the discussion. One, um, could you, if, if, you get, if I could ask you to just to line up at the microphone over there. Um, Thank, you, yes. Thank you, all of you are really incredible heroes and we're, we're just so happy that you're here with us at, at IDS um, Spotlight Health. It seems to me that you know, underlying all of your work about the last mile is this profound sense, moral sense, in that every single person counts and the notion of the right to health. And we know, I worked with Mary Robinson for years on this notion of right to health, and in some countries it's embraced, in other places it is not. And it seems to me that in Rwanda you have this unusual situation, in Liberia you have unusual political leadership, and both for Jacques and for our colleague on Native Americans, you have not have political support for the work that you've done. So what extent do you think that working at the last mile, which implies the very hardest to serve, the most underrepresented person, is necessary to have a political support? And if so, how have you managed to be able to get it? Great question. Great question. Um, perhaps, Jack, you could start with them? So, yeah, I think for us it has been a blessing not having political support. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because when we built, you know, when we decided, you know, committee decided to expand the clinic, we didn't have building permit. And the government has been, hasn't issued any building permit for the last four years. So we had pygmies who don't, you know, legally they're not obliged for anything. We started building and they wanted to carry stone, to dig and everything. So no one, you know, not having political support, they couldn't, having the pygmies helped us, but also it's a burden. You know, I, we, I come from DRC, it's a failed state. I, I'm not ashamed to say that, it's a failed state and that's, kind of leadership we're trying to pro also provide through this, what we're doing. Having a failed state, people who don't understand uh, what it is to work for communities, for the population, they, what they care about is just money and their self-interest. They want to get rich. Having them, knowing that I come from America, which is the truth, they believe that I have money. I only have to give them money. So having them away was a blessing for us. Hmm. And now, can we try uh, to put yeah. them on Skype? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But now, we completed the, 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 the facility. It's a beautiful facility. The governor, because it's two years before the election, the governor wants to come to visit. And I told him, okay, you want to come to visit? You need to give this. Mm -hmm. we, have, we are hiring two extra physicians. You need to, support, you know, to provide you know, support for four, five years to pay our physician. That's the requirement. So, because he needs that for his, uh, his campaign. Wow. So that. I was wondering, Peter, if you could just add to that from a country that has really supported um, last mile healthcare in a way that I don't think others have. 
Yeah, I mean, you know, the, the sort of the new Rwanda was born out of its historical context. And I think a lot of the stuff that we're talking about was embedded in policy and even in the Constitution because the government saw that what happened in 1994 was a consequence of inequality and exclusion and disparities, et cetera. And so they see improving health and making sure no one's left behind as a national security imperative. Raj touched on this earlier because, you know, it's the, it's the, the young and the vulnerable and the unemployed and the sick and the disaffected who are going to be fodder for, um, uh, you know, being recruited uh, in, in, in perpetrating violence. And, uh, and, and so, so this notion of sort of health equity and the, and the right to health was actually written into the new constitution. You should have seen the pre-genocide constitution. It's horrible. Uh, and the new constitution, which was ratified in 2003, has this stuff written in. And so government officials feel like, well, I actually have a constitutional mandate to not ignore those people. Uh, and then policies then can follow from there that mayors and, and, and policymakers and ministers are evaluated based on how well they do in mm -hmm. delivering for those communities. Uh, and so it actually creates then sort of an incentive to do so. Um, uh, they didn't know how to do it, uh, but at least that spirit was there. And then we sort of built, uh, we, we, we built around that. Hmm, that's great. Yeah. Our next question. Hi. Thank you again, everybody. Um, I'm a pediatric nurse, so my interest is in children. And uh, I was in the Peace Corps, and one project that I worked on was I took 10, 11, and 12-year-olds, two from each grade, taught them to be junior health promoters with the idea that they would go back and educate their class and their families to, to spur interest in healthcare at that age. I'd love to hear what work is being done with children. Hmm. I don't know who of you could best speak to that. And, and you mean specifically to get them with in, a, in a, as a future health promoter? Or yeah. And our work, you know, in terms of directly engage, uh, direct engagement has been with people above the age of 18. Uh, in Liberia, 18 and 30 is considered youth. Certainly, you know, 80% of our workforce are young people in that way. But I think you're asking a, a slightly different question. So I don't know if others have examples. I, we, we, uh, Sean, you can yeah. address that um, for what we're doing in our um, in, in our early childhood program, we've incorporated nutrition aspects, um, also greenhouses so that kids get a real understanding of um, healthy lifestyles from that perspective, um, which also engages parents in that, in that process. So we've um, tackled at the earliest age groups um, in the um, child care and the early childhood realms, um, which is a model that could be replicated. I, I'm not sure about the third world countries and how that works, but in, in in my community, that's what we've done to support um, healthy lifestyle living. Um, and then they have also a, a health uh, round um, house where they have all the children and the parents at the beginning of the school year um, go and they get health checkups and, and dental and all of those things. And plus guest speakers come into the school and, and teach about that. But nutrition has been incorporated as part of the curriculum. So that's been an important thing. Thank you. I would just say from, from our perspective, looking over the last 30 or so years at Partners in Health's work, um, a, lot of, a lot of this has actually come from kids who were sick themselves with chronic disease, be it HIV or now survivors of cancer and other kinds of things, um, where they had gone through the health system and been, gotten a new lease on life and, uh, and themselves want to become providers because of what they've experienced. And, and, and you know, many of us have been through similar experiences. One of the things that motivates us to want to be healers. Uh, and so we do have programs where, for example, adolescents living with HIV who are doing pretty well are engaged as peer educators in a group or in their schools, et cetera, and it gives them kind of a leadership and a mentorship responsibility and puts them in kind of a position of authority and caring for others that I think can really engender some of that. Uh, and also for lots of these kids living with chronic diseases, the ones who are really, really poor, we try to support education uh, and, and put them through primary school, in some cases secondary school. And uh, a couple of years ago in Rwanda, the first class of, uh, of, of kids who we had supported through secondary school finish and 40 of them scored so well on their national exam that they got scholarships from the government to go to university uh, and so many of them now are studying medicine and nursing and agriculture um, there's a couple studying engineering but a lot of them are actually going to come back as health professionals we've already made some of them interns during their their summer holidays that's great yeah uh, so peter kind of uh set me up for my question so thank you <laughs> um and which was about the sort of transition globally to more chronic diseases and 
whether you're seeing that in the more remote areas. I mean, I'm sure with Sean, that's a huge part of the um, last mile, mile healthcare work that you're doing. But as the sort of epidemiological transition happens, whether it's happening in those places and how that's changing um, your work in those places. Yeah, I mean, I, I can answer from a Liberia perspective. So we focus really on, on the majority of the program on the top 10 killers. Uh, one of those is hypertension or high blood pressure and the sequelae of it, right? Heart, heart attacks and strokes. And there hadn't been a single program in Liberia, at least, that involved community health workers doing diagnosis with blood pressure cuffs, referrals, and then actually helping initiate and or manage treatment. And so we launched that in these two districts that we're working in and have managed to provide that now for every single man, woman, and child. And what's been interesting is not only the the fact that there are obviously people with the condition, uh, but that it opens a whole new conversation from a, and I'm a primary care doc myself, about what health means and what disease means. So typically the experience for someone who gets sick in a community is, in the healthcare system is that they had to get acutely ill. They had to have a fever. They had to have a cough uh, before they d thought that they needed healthcare. Uh, with chronic diseases, so much of it is silent for so long that uh, we have found through our community health workers that uh, when you screen and you di diagnose an, uh, an asymptomatic, someone without symptoms, patient with high blood pressure, they then realize they need to start on treatment. That has opened up a whole new conversation about what disease really means. So we've seen both the need for it and just the sort of collateral benefits that come uh, in trying to reinforce not acute care, but longitudinal primary care, ongoing care that can be delivered. Uh, agreed. I, I think that uh, like with diabetes, high blood pressure, and um, all of those kind yeah. of ailments, um, right now it's, you know, kind of like treat, you know, not being proactive. In a way, we're starting to be proactive now, but in the past it's just been, you know, treating the, the problems. Um, and I think with uh, being proactive and, and really it goes back to the culture of health and how you're promoting that idea of health in the community and it's not just looking at one thing but all things um, like incorporating nutrition training in the younger group involving the the adolescents in, in learning about business and in entrepreneurship in, in farmers markets and really taking a, a, a bigger picture look at it um, to be proactive in a community as opposed to just treating the crisis it's, it's difficult to do but you eventually do see a turnaround if I can just add one, one quick point. We see that I I as well, for sure, and are transitioning a lot towards non-communicable diseases. They were always there, but something else killed you first. And right. once you take that stuff away, it unmasks yeah. that. Um, you know, care delivery principles for chronic diseases are all relatively similar. Like the stuff that you need to do and the way you organize your system um, to treat cancer or hypertension or diabetes is not that different from HIV. And so we've taken a lot of those lessons. One really interesting thing, I think, is that care delivery innovations that are largely coming from last mile communities, places where, for example, these organizations are working, have proven to be really smart strategies for chronic disease management in non-last mile health communities in places like the US, where we do a really bad job of episodic acute management management of chronic diseases by having more community outreach and accompaniment at the community level, um, decentralizing care and other kinds of things. And so I think there are really lessons um, here that are coming out of Liberia that can help us, uh, you know, as we implement the Affordable Care Act, for example. Yeah. No, I, th I, th yeah. I think that's the, that's the, you know, the beauty and the, and the strength of community health worker program. Yeah. It's the most cost effective way of dealing with these chronic diseases. But but also you know speaking uh, you know as a doctor working in a you know hospital setting, you just don't separate those things you know chronic or non-chronic. You just treat you know. So for us, I, I'm kind of lost in this debate of uh, non -com communicable disease, non-communicable. For us, it doesn't make any, it doesn't make any difference. You ever had blood pressure? You show up at the hospital, we'll treat you. Mm -hmm. Community for workers will take care of children who, are, who have diarrhea or pneumonia as well as the person who is suffering from diabetes. So it, it, you know, working in a community, there is no difference. I think the debate, to me, the debate is just in uh, do, a donor level. But for us, we focus the same amount. Malaria is the biggest for us, pneumonia and diarrhea. We put a lot of money in malaria and those things. That we have less diabetes, we put less money, but everybody is taken care of according to the numbers of people who are suffering from those. This, that, that's 
I That's could see, though, that the training would differ for the community right. health workers accordingly right. Right. if they are also dealing with diabetes right. and uh, right. hypertension. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Um, thank you all, wonderful panel. I wonder if any, any one of you could really speak on, um, maybe with the exception of Rwanda, um, on sustainability of these wonderful programs um, that are being initiated. I think as, as Peggy mentioned, if they find a way into the policy and they get into policy documents and they're translated, we rarely see if there isn't a clear sustainability plan, if there isn't a clear government you know, ownership and initiative, that those great plans, you know, they could be piloted, are really elate, later on translated into action and are sustained. Just you know, just to just to mention, Tanzania has just I think learning from Rwanda and other countries has just completed their first policy for coming up with this cadre of community health workers. So it's really great because neighbors are learning. Yeah. But the key question is, how are we ever gonna pay for this? You know, with a huge with a huge gap in human uh, skilled healthcare providers, yeah. how can they even start to think about finding the resources to have them actually in the payroll? So I'm, I'm just thinking aloud from your experiences yeah. and how we can tap onto that. Raj, I'd love to hear what you think. Sure, sure. I, I mean, I think one, you do have to, if, if part of your model is to reach the last mile, public sector has got to be involved in that. It doesn't, it shouldn't only be the public sector, the private sector should be as well. But so certainly you, ha I think you have to have that kind of leadership. Uh, and we, in Liberia, we've been fortunate. We're right in that phase where we've helped the government with a number of other partners create a plan, an operational plan, president has come out to support the idea of this being launched. There's some talk of her potentially convening the bilateral and multilateral funder, so that's a line. So you, I think you just have to have that. Uh, that's not alone sufficient, um, but that's, that's a piece of it. I would just ar put the other argument out there that can we really afford not to do this? Um, when you have, uh, just take Liberia, 60% of your rural population without any access to care. When you have 75 countdown countries that have had a ton of focus on them for Millennium Development Goals only reaching half of their people with the basic health services, uh, how is it that we're going to sustain this progress in child mortality reduction from 10 million to 6.6 .6 million a year around the world? We could do it like this. Um, and I, so I think. I think that kind of national leadership is key and the international funding relationship is key as well. And you know, frankly, all of us have to do an even better job of, of explaining the economic value, right? I mean, there, when you invest uh, in a community health worker in last mile areas, often that is the health system. It's the start of it, it's the one that gets them in. So it's sometimes just the basic investment on its own. Uh, and, and we've got to more clearly articulate the kind of value and efficiency that comes from paying someone $80 a day or $80 a month uh, and providing a, a whole package of essential care at that community level versus, say, uh, doing nothing about it and, and what that could mean for, for people's mortality rates but also just inefficiencies in the system. I mean, the hospital, uh, when, when these people, it's not like people don't ever reach care. When they come in uh, and they haven't been treated for malaria for two days in the community, that two-year-old child comes in after their mother has heroically tried to walk them two days with cerebral malaria, and then you spend uh, three, four days of uh, three or four nurses' time, maybe a doctor's time, the IV lines, the fluid, the, the inpatient care. I mean, there's all sorts of great analogies and analytics in this country for that kind of outpatient delivery versus inpatient care. I think we just gotta get better at communicating that. Peter, I know, this reminds me of what you said at the start of the panel about how last mile healthcare delivery, we should think of it as both being morally right and epidemiologically smart. Yeah. Yeah. Um, could you unpack that a little in terms of how it could relate to sustainability? Yeah, I mean, well, first of all, bad care is really expensive. Um, and, and in good care that's decentralized yeah. to the people is often less expensive. And um, if you look at burden of disease, right, we always talk at Partners Health about burden and gap. What are the gaps in the health system? Where is the burden of disease greatest? The burden of disease is overwhelmingly higher often in last mile communities. And this is where people are dying of stupid stuff where kids are dying of yeah. diarrhea and pneumonia and vaccine preventable diseases and moms are dying in childbirth for lack of a blood transfusion or a, a widely available inexpensive medication. Um, and so that's also from a public health standpoint to me that's also the low-hanging fruit um, where you can you can deliver a lot of gains you know, in these communities where kids are dying you know 
have a one in three or one in four risk of dying before their fifth birthday. If you want to reach the MDG for child mortality, you got to go to those communities in order to do so. And what it takes to do so is actually not very expensive. Community health workers are cheap. Vaccines are cheap. Um, Anti-malarials are cheap. So Rwanda made the decision to kind of preferentially invest in um, uh, in primary health care uh, and, and to, to buttress kind of the, the community, not only the community health system, but, but local health care system. A lot of countries make the mistake of putting too much money into tertiary and quaternary referral hospitals, specialists, CAT scanners, PET scanners. Not that those things aren't important. Rwanda just said, we'll get there later. We're going to start with this stuff. And the results that Rwanda's gotten have not been because they get more aid than other countries in the region or that they spend more money. Actually, the opposite. You know, these most dramatic improvements in health in human history have been delivered for $50 per capita per year. It's jump change. It's more than the two or three dollars per capita per year that a lot of African countries were able to invest, uh, you know, before um, uh, you know before AIDS financing, you know, catalyzed this this movement for global health. But it's nothing compared to the ten, twelve thousand dollars per capita we're spending here. Um, so I think that there's a lesson there for sustainability. Look at the, I mean, you know, the the in, in countries where sixty or seventy percent of health investment goes through NGOs, and those NGOs are taking. 60, 70 percent in country and out of country overhead, those, that money should be reinvested in community health workers. Some mm -hmm. of that money should be invested directly in governments as long as there's accountability to do so. And again, Rwanda's provided some examples, of, I think, of potential solutions. I think it was just an article that came out in the last few days. USAID brought a bunch of private sector leaders together and found just by go, not money that's already available in the system that they were spending on health care, that there was $2.9 billion yeah. of money that could be reallocated. And they think that reallocating that mainly to community health workers could save 500,000 more maternal and child lives in the coming years. So, that, so I, I, I do think there's a, a, a huge, huge opportunity in that. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think we're almost out of time, but uh, maybe we could just take these, uh, these two last Wait, questions okay. very quickly. So building on these excellent comments, uh, I'm on the board of the IRC, International yeah. Rescue Committee, another INGO, low overhead INGO, I should mm -hmm. point out. Um, some of the research that we've done shows that the, particularly with prevention of child pneumonia or treatment of child pneumonia, that the outcomes by community health workers in the villages are superior to the yeah. outcomes in health clinics. Yeah. Which raises the interesting question, do you think there's a theoretical ceiling on the scope of practice of community health workers? Or, I mean, obviously yeah. there's some things, deliveries and health centers for high-risk high women that you have to have the health center for, but couldn't a lot of care actually be provided by community health workers? And do you believe that we've tested the limits of the scope of practice for those workers? I think we're not even close to testing the limits. Yeah. And I think that, uh, and, and a couple of quick data points to, to say to justify why um, it, it, number one the Alaskans uh, have been doing this since the 50s they started with TB community health workers now do uh, the Ethiopians are doing a ton of work with health extension workers that almost you could say it's between what we all imagine a community health worker to be now and what a nurse does and it's somewhere in between and I think that they, they cover the whole gamut of services I have to say that you cannot, you know, this whole idea of, of task sharing, task shifting, uh, this cannot be task dumping, right? You cannot dump tasks onto people who have never had passed a sixth, seventh grade education, never had a formal job, who are great leaders, who have the ability to do this without also providing support to make sure that they're performing well. So, I mean, one of the things we do is to make sure a nurse like Alice spends an hour of time every week with these community health workers coaching them on how to improve their clinical competency. And so what we've seen is the same thing I felt going from first year of med school to the third year of med school is that if you're in it and you're continuously coached and you're supported, uh, just like any of us would want to be in our jobs, you can actually improve the level of skills, your mastery of skills, just like any other person would. But that investment's got to come. And it can't be just peer-led community health worker leaders doing it. That's, they're also important for the managerial task, but it's got to be a clinical person involved in coaching them as well. And those add some investment, but they also gain a lot of value from it. But, but briefly, briefly, I would like to say that to be a best, uh, the best practi uh, practitioner, you need to know your patients. Community health workers right. know their community right. better than anyone, than myself, than our nurses. They know their patients. <coughs> the community trusts them. So why don't we give the extra training? Because they know, they know the real problems. They are the only ones who know the problems. So I think that uh, for us, 
it's a matter of time. We need to invest more and more in these community health workers and even bring it up. Uh, Peter can speak more about that. They need more trainings. We need to trust them. They need to be able to treat pneumonia yeah. widely. And that's how we'll, we'll, we'll bring the mortality rate down. More, more and more people will be saved. I think that maybe we should just move on to our last question right now, but I know that all of you have much more to say on this. I'll make it quick. Looking 10 years out, how do you all imagine mental health care being folded into this last mile package of um, services? Uh, I can start. Mental health is a big issue in Rwanda, really across uh, across the world. Obviously, it's probably um, you know amongst the sort of neglected diseases that are really high burden. The most shameful, I think, example. Uh, Rwanda, because of its history, has a tremendous burden of mental illness. When we first moved into this community called Butaro to build a hospital, we had a little temporary hospital set up, and 28% of our adult admissions in the first year were um, were psychiatric, um, uh, wow. not HIV. More than HIV, triple the, the HIV admissions that we had actually. So we realized actually that if we talk about burden and gap. We need to re reorient ourselves a little bit. One of the ways that we're approaching this now is through what we call, are calling integrated chronic care, um, where we say, look, we can learn from HIV to treat diabetes and hypertension because you need the same principles. You need to have a system which can treat folks longitudinally, which has outreach into communities for adherence support and psychosocial support, that has information systems that can help you understand what the treatment plan is, what worked and what didn't work before and where you're going, et cetera, et cetera. And so, um, so we sort of are trying to bring together HIV, NCDs, as we call them, non-communicable diseases, and then, and then mental health into sort of one package. And it doesn't necessarily mean the same person's going to be able to deliver all of that stuff, but that's the way we're trying to get at the health center level, the clinic level, um, the programs to start to do. What allows us to do also is say, okay, there's a ton of money for HIV, and there's no money for mental health. You put it all into the same thing, and you can really leverage the investment for one disease into the other. Mm. I see that as integrative services and in, in having um, health staffing teams to support that. Well, thank you so much, um, and thank you all for being here. Um, really appreciated this discussion, and you know um, all of the themes that you brought up about indigenous health and trusting your the community health worker and how you incentivize them. All of them. So, thank you all so much for thank being you. here. Yeah. Yeah.